Hi everyone, welcome to our Power Tools training with an analytics focus. This is our new name for the monthly trainings that go in depth in a variety of features in the tools. Not only explaining how you do things and how you actually get things done in the tools, but the why. So why is it strategically imperative? What can you learn from it? And how can you make your program grow as a result? So today we're gonna to be talking with some of our analytics geniuses here in Blue State who are in the tools every day on behalf of our amazing clients. But first, a few housekeeping notes. This is being recorded. Please ask any questions as we go. You'll see we have a Q&A after the fact. And this will all be sent out in addition to supplementary resources um, regarding analytics and setting goals in the tools. First, I am Jilly. I am the Director of Community for the Blue State Tools. You hear from me a lot. I, I lead these trainings and also monthly or quarterly events in various cities where we organize different tools users to get together and share what they're learning and seeing. And also additional content to make sure that you are seeing the latest and greatest from what's happening across our amazing community of users. Seth, many of you know, I'm sure, or have exchanged a ticket or two with. He's our SVP of Client Services. Erwin is our digital analyst based in New York, who with a focus on nonprofit and advocacy clients. And Paul Hunt is a strategy director with a focus on analytics based in our DC office. So today we're gonna take a look at how you can really create insights and forecast your success by looking at your past performance um, of data and actions and metrics that are based in the Blue State tools. So we're gonna throw out a hypothetical question that you probably have had to answer actually. It's not that hypothetical. Um, for a lot of us, you know, the size of our email list is really a healthy metric for us to gauge the success of our program and how much money we'll raise or actions will be taken. And so you can imagine a world where, or maybe you had to do this earlier this year, um, where you're asked, how much will, will our email list grow in 2016? Now, the goal setting exercise we're going about to embark on could easily be applied to a fundraising projections exercise or increasing your action rate over the year over year. So there are a lot of different um, objectives and frameworks for which this can apply. We're just focusing on email because that seems to probably be a universal goal that a lot of us have, which is to grow the size of our community. So your CMO has likely thrown out a number out there, maybe <laughs> once or twice, um, maybe a nice new $1 million or donors or constituents would be, you know, just great to get done in the year. Or maybe they wanna go bigger. The good thing is, and you should feel empowered by the fact that we know that those aren't really realistic goals, and we wanna be sure that you have the data um, and the insights to be able to come back to such an inquiry or assumption um, with real data and insights that can inform you know, how you handle these types of projections that are grounded in reality, grounded in past performance, but are obviously aspirational for the future. So now we're gonna to go to the tools. Orwin's gonna to begin in the tools install under the analytics tab and the sign up stats and exports. And actions that have been taken over time, um, period. In this case, when we say actions, this can mean any type of thing possible. Um, a, a contribution, a speak out, a share, anything that has an action registered in the back end of the BSD tools is going to be included here. Um, for, for the sake of, of this conversation, we're just going to leave that blank. Um, we can set any, any time range here. We can choose chapters or sources or any of that good stuff. Um, what I'm going to focus on right now um, and what I'm really interested in is how we've grown over the past year. So I'm going to look at actions over time. And this is going to give us a, a, a day, day by day breakdown of all of the actions that have been taken in the tools um, since we started. I'm going to switch this to a month view because I like looking at some aggregated numbers that make a bit more sense to me. So here we're going to see um, how, how our list has grown over the past year. I'm going to export, this is all dummy data and I've um, changed some of these numbers 
but in the uh, in, in the spreadsheet, the example that we're going to show you. But I'm just going to download this file, and when I open it up, we're going to see something that looks a bit like this. It's not going to have the same formatting or anything, but you're going to get these three columns. And the one that I'm going to be most interested in right now is first time actions right here. This is um, a first time action is sort of the, a true sign up, if you will, in the BSD tool. This is how we know when people have um, created a new cons record uh, within the tool. So these are what we often call as um, uh, new constituents, right? Um, old constituents or former constituents that already have a, a cons record associated um, in, in the tools, they can still take actions, they can fill out sign-up forms, they can, they can you know, donate to your organization, any of those things. That will be included in a unique constituent actions or total actions. So maybe the first thing that I want to do when I open up a spreadsheet like this is figure out um, you know, how much did we grow? You'll see this number uh, that I just pulled in that con search. Uh, that's where we started at the beginning of January 2015, 5,228. Now I wanna know what our average monthly is. So I'm gonna do a quick average of these first time actions and I'll see, hey, you know, we, we grew approximately 1,000 people uh, per month. Um, and then at the, at the end, or how many did we add total over the year though? Uh, we'll just do this guy and we will take a quick sum. Ah, so we actually grew by 13,000 folks, right? Uh, which means that at the end of, at the end of the year, we grew to a size of 18,000, right? Um, what else I might do is figure out what our overall growth rate was for the year. And to do this, we're going to take, um, we're going to take the difference of our, ending point and our starting point and just do a percent change here so 251 percent change that's a pretty dramatic improvement and so where where did that improvement come well I've I've sort of made a, a quick chart here in Excel to see month by month where that growth uh, showed up and it looks like we had a pretty big peak here in May 2015 and we had maybe a, a, a series of campaigns or something happening between August and October of 2015 um, that's really useful and important for us to know. And, and now what I really want to figure out is what happened in those months that, that gave us that, that growth, right? Uh, so that we can figure out what levers we're going to pull in the future. In this case, I'm going to go and look at where the signups came from in May 2015. So I'm going to head back over to the tools. I'll be in the, the signup stats and exports again. And for this example, um, I'm going to look at a raw export of data. Um, full disclosure, as an analyst here at BSD, this is where I do most of my work. I just prefer to use raw exports and pretty much anything that we show you here today, you can do from a raw export, um, which you can access here, or you can also access in the advanced reports and data. Um, and there's a bunch of queries in here that will get you the same data. So I'm just gonna download this file. And when I open that up, it's gonna look a whole lot like this guy. Um, you're going you're gonna to have a, a report of all of the actions that were taken over a, a period of time. And it's going to have uh, all associated data with, with that action, including what I'm most interested in, sign up form name in this case, as well as whether that was a first time action. Because remember, we want to know whether the person joined the list here. Now, at BSD, what I'm going to be doing, and very quickly, is I'm going to create a pivot table of this data so I can very quickly aggregate and see which signup forms um, are, are at play here. So if you don't know what a pivot table is, I'm going to show you real quickly. Again, this is recorded, so you can always like go back and see. For those of you who like sleep their way through pivot tables because it's second nature, I apologize, but we're just going to do this real quick um, because this is sort of how I would do it. So we're going to go over to the data tab. First, select all of your data in the, in the table. Go to your data tab here. And just hit this button for pivot table. It'll open a, a new sheet for you. It'll auto-populate this stuff. That's rarely useful for anything. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of everything here. Um, the rows that I want to be looking at in this case are sign up form. So I'm going to drag, drag that down into our row label and see that's going to populate all of the possible signup forms that are at play here. And then I'm going to do a count of all of the constituent IDs that are associated with those signup forms. Um, this automatically set that as sum, so I'm going to change that real quickly to count because I, I don't want to add up those numbers. 
And then I also am going to want to just filter this, this table, this pivot table um, for first time actions. So I'm just going to move this over into a report filter and make sure that we're only looking at first time actions. And to make this nice and easy, we can see this. You can see that we had you know, three main forms that were at play and also one that doesn't have any form associated with it. That's just um, something that sometimes happens with the data. Um, here we have a spring campaign that seems to be, you know, oh, we ran that in May. That makes a whole lot of sense. That's where most of our acquisition came from. Um, maybe that also gave us a bit more press around some, some events that we were running. Um, we had a, a sign up form on a blog post and, and maybe our main sign up on the homepage, for example. Again, this is all made up data, but this is an interesting way to sort of see how people were joining the list during this time of, of peak acquisition. Um, and, and it's pretty clear that this is all associated with the major campaign that we ran um, at that time. Now, if you remember from our monthly breakdown, we also had uh, these, these higher periods of acquisition in, in the late summer and early fall. And I'm sort of interested in, in what's going on there. So I could do the same thing and look specifically at acquisition over those three months and break that down by form. But I happen to also know that during that between August and October of 2015, we were doing a little bit of paid media, right? Uh, and so in this in that case, what I might want to do is look at source codes rather than forms. And so what I might pull up, if you go back to sign up stats and exports, you can you can click this tab for method or source. Again, if you apply different filters here, say I could filter this um, for a specific sign up form or any sign up form, right? And then this module would change to be sign up and source or, or what have you. But in this case, because I'm only curious about sign up source, I'm gonna get an export of this data here. And you can see that it's gonna include a whole bunch of different sources of, of where people um, were, were signing up or where they were coming from when they signed up. So I'm gonna download that. And when I open it up, it's gonna look a whole lot like this guy. And we can see here, um, this is for the entire year, and here's that, that number for the spring campaign that we ran in May. That makes sense for us. And here are those paid media campaigns that I remember us running in August, September, and October. But I'm also seeing a whole lot of random stuff going on down here, and this is going to happen all of the time. We're going to have a, a, a weird referral from Twitter with a few things associated with it. You might get some old stuff from, you know, previous campaigns a long time ago because source codes are sort of sticky and they, they travel. Um, I see Paul had his own display ad going on. Jilly over <laughs> here had some type of, of campaign running. These are things that are, that are going to happen and it's just going to make your, your data a little bit messy. That's to be expected. The best way to get around this is to be very diligent about the way that you are sourcing all of your content. Um, the more accurately and, and the more diligent you are about sourcing, the, the less you're going to see of this randomness that is happening or some of these old stuff that, that is coming through. And there's a whole blog post and resources about, about sourcing that, that, we will, um, that we will share with you about ways to do that to make your data even cleaner. But this is sort of how we might expect that to come. And, uh, and, and the real thing that's important here is that we can see these three ad campaigns did particularly well. We got a whole lot of signups on them. Looks like almost 4,000 signups. Um, and that our acquisition is actually from those campaigns in, in August, September, and October that we were running here. Um, so that, that's super important for us. Um, finally, if, if you know, we wanted to know what other signups were happening outside of these or, or how things were coming through organically or to fill in gaps in, in our data that you might find here. You might wander into Google Analytics or whatever web um, analytics platform that you're using and I might corroborate or, or calculate different things from that. So if you do this, my preferred method in whatever, you know, say you're using Google Analytics, then I would just do a, a export by channel grouping, by default channel grouping. This is some, some made up data. Um, and the, and the reason this is important for us here is because we can see exactly how many visits were associated with each channel. We can calculate conversion rates based on, say, the, the month. Um, in May, we had, this is the, the month index for, for May. We know we had approximately 
3,000 signups in that month from 18,000 visits. So we can calculate the conversion rate of that month in particular as 16%, right? You can calculate all of these things and you can figure out what, the, what the, those conversion rates are. Um, Google Analytics, if you have a goal set up, can do that automatically for you over here um, to, to figure out those conversions. This is a really nice way to figure out um, your most successful channel, what's working, what's not working, and to drill a little bit deeper into how all of this is working. And this is really the only way that you're gonna accurately figure out or even calculate your conversion rates, right? Because the way that we do conversion rates um, on the website or for acquisition, you're gonna be looking at the total signups in any given period of time, um, divided by uh, the, the total visits that, that could have been associated with, with a signup, um, which is why we ran this calculation here. Uh, so with that, I think that sort of covers our, our quick and dirty, you know, here's some of the math on how to, how to figure some of this stuff out and to sort of bring it back to that higher level um, thinking and the strategy and, and what does all of this mean. So I just showed you how this works in Excel, where to pull some of this data in the tools. I'm going to hand it back over to Paul to sort of talk about um, where that leads us and, and, and what we do after we've done all this math stuff. Great. So, if we had if we had just looked at sort of the 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 data on its own, um, we might have concluded that we grew by thirteen thousand signups in twenty fifteen. That the average was about eleven hundred a month, and and we would estimate that you know every month we might uh, next year continue to grow by eleven eleven hundred signups a month. But by looking at the signup forms and um, and the source codes, we were able to better understand uh, why our, our growth happened. We saw from the chart that we built that um, growth was not distributed evenly through the year, that there was a campaign in May and then um, paid media work in, in the fall. Um, and so now we have a better sense uh, as we look to make projection for next year as to um, how we might expect to grow. So the, the first lever that we can pull is the organic campaigns. Um, so can we re repeat the success of our May campaign? And, and maybe we can do two campaigns this year instead of one. That was, that was definitely the biggest sort of single month of growth that we saw. The, the next thing is, is for paid media, that growth isn't gonna come back organically. It really depends on our budget. So, um, if we're gonna have the same budget this year that we had last year, then, then maybe we can replicate that growth. Um, but if not, maybe we shouldn't count it into our plans. And then finally, we can think a little bit more about the organic growth. So um, though we didn't cover this, let's assume that we had seen a really steady trend of, of traffic growth. Do we think that that's gonna continue? Um, maybe the organization has recently become more visible um, and traffic is up, um, but sort of underlying all of, those campaigns and the and the paid media, there was some consistent group through that main signup form that we saw, um, consistent signups there, and that's driven largely by by site traffic. And then the last thing is is the signup form itself. So um, Orwin showed how we can collect Google Analytics data to to give us a sense of of the conversion rate. Um, and if we looked at just the main form, we would find that the conversion rate for that page has been really consistent throughout last year. Um, but maybe there's an opportunity to improve there um, to get more people to sign up. So could we run experiments and improve our performance uh, on that form? So we've taken these four levers and we've put them into sort of a, a potential projection and uh, where we're trying to estimate the, the strategic inputs that we have at our hand. So first we have our starting point. We know that we're gonna start the year with, uh, with 5,000. Um, then, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, let's say that next year, instead of running that one organic campaign, we run two of them and, and the campaign we ran last spring uh, got us 3,500 constituents. So maybe we'll do um, twice that. Um, then for paid media, um, in this case, we're going to assume that our budget is going to be reduced and that we're not going to have the same budget as the previous year. Um, so we'll only have uh, 1,300 constituents there. Um, 
for site tra traffic, uh, let's expect that the growth rate is, continues to be stable. So if last year we grew by uh, 5,700 organically, um, we'll, we'll multiply that by 1.08. And then finally, for the uh, for the sign-up form, we're planning to do some experiments, and we think we can get a five percent performance bonus out of that. And so we can um, drive up the expectations for the main form uh, by five percent. And so if you add those numbers together, you get a, a total growth amount of, of fourteen thousand. Um, if we add that to the five thousand we started with, and then the uh, the thirteen thousand from last year that puts us uh, somewhere around 35,000 total at the end of 2016. Um, that's still a pretty ambitious growth rate. It's not, it's not the 250% growth rate that we saw from uh, in 2015. It's certainly not the billion signups that our CMO asked for, but at least now we know uh, how we're gonna grow and, and what the mechanics will be for the next year. And so this has been like a really hypothetical example of an imaginary client. Um, imaginary organization, but these same principles and lessons and, and types of growth uh, apply to the, to the projects that we work on every day. So we're gonna share a couple of, of quick examples of this. So the example of the, the spring campaign that generates a lot of signups, um, that's fairly similar to how the NAACP has grown over the years. Um, so this next chart shows uh, the number of signups every month for the NAACP, and you can see that there's three um, really significant spikes. Uh, the spike in the middle for the Zimmerman trial, uh, it actually extends further up the graph uh, by about a factor of six. Um, but this is how the NAACP grows, is that when, when there's a uh, civil rights injustice that happens, they organize their constituents, they give them an action that they can take, they respond quickly, um, and it's in those moments that they can grow really significantly. Um, and those, those growth opportunities can be rather hard to predict, um, but knowing that that's the structure of, of sort of how the list has changed in the past allows us to not make sort of uh, unwise assumptions about future growth. So if we just looked at you know, the, the total growth for 2013 and divided by 12 and said that's our estimate for monthly growth for the next year, we would be way off because the, um, the Zimmerman trial really throws a lot of that uh, out the window. Um, so this is an example of how media-driven uh, campaigns can be the, the engine of your, of your list growth and how you have to take account of those when you're making future projections. So I'm going to hand over to Orwin, who has an example where um, paid media is the main factor in, in the organization's growth plan. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, so I'm going to talk for a minute about the California Hospital Association. Um, they've, we've been working with them for a while, and, and the way that they've grown um, is, is sort of the opposite of, of how NAACP has grown, which is a very old, established organization with a very large and passionate community. And our challenge with California Hospital Association was to create um, a community, build a, a community um, to advocate on, on behalf of, of hospitals and healthcare in California. And we sort of helped create this from the very beginning and it's a very new organization. It started in about 2014 and their growth has been much more consistent and, and concerted. And the way that we've gone about growing the community in this case is largely with paid media efforts, lots of different ads and, and, and petitions and, and things. And even though uh, this community does rally around key moments, um, it's not quite in the same way that say NAACP um, rallies around a specific um, injustice that, that captures a whole lot of media attention. Um, those, those opportunities aren't quite as, as large um, for hospitals and healthcare in, in this case. And so we haven't been able to rely on those types of things or, or predict when that's gonna happen. So um, you can see in this case, when we tried to project where we're going to land at the end of 2016, for example, the levers that we're gonna be focusing on are, are specifically around paid media and our efforts because we sort of know exactly how much we can spend in any given year and how we can allocate that to, to optimize our program. But um, we can have a better sense, I think, even more so than NAACP, of where we're going to land at the end of 2016, because we do fully understand all of the inputs that go in, and we don't necessarily rely on those, those key moments and events like, like NAACP does. 
So these are these are two very quick examples of how um, your list might grow over time to radically different examples, I would say. Um, one that focuses largely on organic movements and um, and media that's sort of beyond the control of the organization. And the other one is almost entirely created by the organization itself. In the, in the case of California Hospitals Association, um, that community has, has been built, like I said, um, from, from specifically paid media and you know, building our own moments or, or their own moments rather than NAACP. So understanding quite the, the framework as we've sort of outlined with how to access this data from the tool, the tools and, um, and Paul's projections that, that he just shared, uh, we can sort of apply these different levers to our organization or whatever organization you might be working with to sort of figure out and, and, and predict or try to project um, things like growth of a community. Although the principles that are, are present here that we've sort of outlined um, can, can very easily be applied uh, to say fundraising projections or, or you know, email projections or any other type of thing that you're trying to figure out using the tools, the same principles will, be, will apply and fully understanding um, what levers are at play and have gone into putting your community or your organization in the position that it currently is, is going to be very important for figuring out um, how, to, how to use the, the analytics features of the tools um, to predict and project performance. So with that, um, I think we can open it up if anyone yeah. has questions. I know we sort of breezed through and, and went pretty quickly through the stuff that was happening in the tools. Um, and we're, we're happy to, to answer any specific questions. If you're like, how do, we, um, how do we do this one particular thing in the tools? Or how would you approach X, Y, or Z? Um, we, can, we can certainly walk you through any of those things as well. Yeah. So now would be a great time if you do have questions um, about anything that Lauren and Paul discussed or, or related uh, topics or issues that you've encountered, um, please type them into the Q&A module. We'll be glad to answer them. I guess in the meantime, could, Lauren, could you elaborate a little bit about GAI and, and the relationship between Google Analytics and the tools yeah, as a starter? Yeah, so I, I very quickly talked us through um, how we approach this in the uh, in Google Analytics to fill in any gaps that we might have um, in, in our data and to also add a bit of color to, um, to the data that we can pull from the tools because the, the tools is only going to collect things that are, that are really happening um, on the side or anything that you are putting in and specifically. And when I say on the side, I mean like if you are, if someone, a constituent is filling out um, a sign up form, a contribution form, if they're clicking on an email, all the things that are directly affiliated um, with the tools backend structure, then, then we capture that within the tools. But to, to get that other information from Google Analytics, we at BSD have, have, a, um, have a, a tool called, uh, well, we have Google Analytics integration. And so this allows us to uh, more closely align the, the BSD tools and, and GA. And so this suite of, of um, tools that are associated with, with Google Analytics integration, it say, for example, automatically tracks a lot of these things for us without all of the custom events that are, that are going into it. So I can quickly go into the tools and if it's a BSD um, sign up form, for example, there might be a, a, a specific GA event that's set up um, using GAI and all of that that is happening. So um, basically anything that is happening in the tools that we can see in the back end of the tools can be tracked in Google Analytics if you are using Google Ana Analytics uh, integration script within, um, within your website. Awesome. And related, um, could you just elaborate on the conversion rate calculation uh, and, and what happens in GA versus the data that's in the tools? Yeah, so um, we, we prefer everything to be done I prefer most things to be done within the BSD tools as like the, the end all be all, the, the data should be in the tools, that's more of like the, the, the final, you know, final say, the back end database, if you will, the back of office database. So that's where I'm going to be looking at um, things like uh, how many signups we're getting or how many conversions we are getting. 
those things can be tracked in Google Analytics and Google Analytics is, is good enough now that those sh things should be pretty close. But sometimes, you know, a JavaScript event might not fire or sometimes a page view might load or be tracked. So there's always going to be some minor discrepancies before the between the data that you see in the BSD tools and the data that is actually pulled into Google Analytics. And so for that reason, I prefer to use our actual conversion data from the BSD tools along with the site-specific data that comes from Google Analytics. So in that case, I would say, I'm gonna be looking at the signups from, from the BSD tools, and I'm gonna look at the, the page views or the, the sessions in Google Analytics on those, um, those associated signup forms. And that's how I would calculate um, a, 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 you know, a signup form conversion rate or a site conversion rate or anything of the like, is by combining those two data sources. Awesome. I would also just quickly add that uh, the the Google Analytics integration, or what what's been called G A G A I here, uh, is available uh, on the Blue State blog. Uh, there is a snippet of code there that you can get from our GitHub, and and all you really need to do is plug that into your wrapper, and it will start working. So uh, if you do want to experiment with that, it's really straightforward. Um, you just need to plug in your uh, existing Google Analytics um, token, your ID, and it will start working, and uh, that can replace your existing code. It'll do all the same things as your your normal code as as uh, as uh, Orb was just saying, track page views and all that, but also the added bonus of doing some cool things around e-commerce if you are a, a client who processes your donations and, and other uh, interesting items. Awesome. And we'll send that around after the fact as well. Absolutely. So Ezra asked, if someone signs up multiple times on multiple forms, does the record show all source code values or just the first and latest? Um, I, I can quickly quickly sum up on this, but Orwin, maybe you have a, a deeper answer here. But um, uh, in a really straightforward way, there are basically two different types of sources that the Blue State tools track. Uh, one is what we call a constituent creation source, which is, as the name would imply, uh, a source code that is created at the time that the constituent is created. So this is, uh, of course, very useful in tracking uh, acquisition and, and where folks came from and when. Um, it's great to do when you're doing uh, even a CSV upload. Maybe it was like a care to or something like that. Uh, so we have those. And then the second type of source is an action source. And, and that action can be sort of any action on the Blue State tools, wherein someone signs up or they make a donation or anything like that. Those are also tracked. So you would have both of those types of sources uh, trackable within the Blue State tools. And like donation source codes are a really good example because you can use, as, as Orwin showed um, uh, earlier in this call, the donation stats and export page to filter your donation stats by source, uh, thereby getting a, a kind of tighter view of, of a particular source and how it's being used and how, it's, uh, how much money it's raising. So think in the case of like uh, maybe source coding the link to the donation form on your homepage, uh, and you can say these are coming through the homepage versus um, you know a link in the footer or something like that. So a lot of different use cases for that. Orwin, do you also want to quickly touch on uh, the sourcer box in the email? Because I think that that kind of ties in with this as well. Or do you do, you, do you have that background? Or? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the the tools has a really great feature for, for creating um, source links for you, and this is called Sorcerer. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful tool that allows you to set source codes, um, not just for the BSD tools that are going to be pulled in as source or subsource that we can track um, in those data exports that I showed you earlier, but it also can allow us to create UTM source codes and, and content codes and, and everything for tracking in Google Analytics so that you can get a, a add more color to, to the way that you are doing your analyses and, and pick apart these very specific um, data points within GA. In Google Analytics, you can't get um, uh, specific individual level data or, or personal information about, the, about users. You just see um, aggregated data or visit level data, right? So you can't necessarily tie one specific visit back to um, a, a very specific contribution or action taking, taken in um, in the tool. So having all of these different campaign codes, content codes, and whatever, all of these things that you can use Sorcerer to help us source, um, that's going to go a long way in, in adding color to all of your analyses and, and you know, keeping track of all the different things that you are running um, in concert with your work in, in the tools. Um, so you can go to the email platform. I know our email team here uses Sorcerer uh, 
all the time to source our links for anything that we do from paid media to, um, to email to social or, or anything else that you may have. Awesome. Thank you. Paul, we're going to Okay, I think Julie was asking me a question, but muted herself. So the next question is, uh, when you're trying to find the starting point um, in, in that uh, search for people, uh, anonymous viewer says that they get a much higher number for unique constituents than the number of subscribed emails. Uh, which of those numbers should I use? So that, that's uh, gonna be fairly common. The, the way that we, we were looking at it um, on a demo account, nobody has unsubscribed, uh, and so the, the difference here is that the um, unique constituent number is is the total number of constituents and then uh, some of those constituents may have unsubscribed uh, from your list and so the, those emails will not show up in the subscribed emails number. In terms of deciding uh, which to use at your starting point, it, it depends on sort of what you're trying to predict. I think in most, most cases, what's of interest will be um, how many people you can reach out to and communicate with. Uh, and so I would look at the subscribe email number as a starting point. Um, however, when you're looking sort of at the, at the acquisition during the year, um, it's useful to know that you acquired uh, 100,000 uh, constituents, but, but then only 80,000 of them continue to be subscribed at the end of the year. Um, so if you want to understand your your sources and, and which forms and stuff like that, um, I might look at, at the total number and then rather than the number of subscribed email addresses. Um, and when we were, we were looking at those constituent records through Sun Stats and Export, um, that's what we saw. That didn't really make a distinction for whether the user was currently subscribed. Another, another useful way of doing this is that um, when you look at constituent groups, you can see the, the total number and the number of subscribed. And you might find differences between um, types of acquisition. So you might find that for your uh, paid campaigns after uh, a year of being on the list, only 85% uh, of those people remain subscribed, whereas for organic campaigns, that number is 95%. Um, that could also inform your decision making as to uh, how you project growth because it sort of means that. Um, you know, for every thousand people that you acquire in in paid media, you you know the equivalent amount that you have to acquire through organic is to keep them subscribed and keep them engaged is going to be uh, a little bit lower. Thank you, Paul, and I am unmuting myself. Thank you for calling me out on that as well. Um, great. Well, it looks like that is it. Uh, super helpful, guys. Thank you, Orwin, Paul, and Seth. We're going to be sending around a survey after this as well. Um, we want to make sure that these are as helpful as possible. So I hope that you learned something new and can take something back uh, to your organization and hopefully your CMO um, as you build, continue to build your amazing digital programs using the tools. So thank you all for joining. Stay tuned for more and have a great rest of the day. Cheers.